Welcome to SI Now. I'm Robin Lundberg. She's Madeline Burke. And in the NBA, another memorable performance from one LeBron James. Madeline, you ever heard of him? Have I heard of him? I sit next to you. I hear about him all the time. Touche. <laughs> but I mean, LeBron made a bold proclamation about his level of play in his 15th season following Wednesday's win over Denver, in which he made three dagger jumpers in the final minute. The four-time MVP, three-time champion, said his game is, quote, probably at an all-time high. First of all, just let that sink in. 15 years into the league and he is peaking now? What is your reaction to this? I mean, LeBron fanboy aside, what is your reaction to this? I think in some ways he's right. Look, he's gotten older, 15 seasons. His athleticism has waned a little bit. So he no longer can beat everyone off the dribble as easily as he used to. You know, defense, he has to pick and choose his spots a little bit more. But as that athleticism has waned to only superhuman level instead of, like, demigod level, right? Right. It, it has been coinciding with his skill level going up. He's a better shooter now than he ever was. He sees the floor as great as he always did, but at an even higher level. So I think it's fair to say LeBron James is at least as good as he's ever been and when he really has that outside shot working as unguardable as he's ever been I mean 15 years into the league I think he's got that veteran wisdom that veteran viewpoint on the game but he is still playing at the LeBron James level where his MVP caliber play is head and shoulders above anyone else's in this league and I think that is definitely something to be noted and you know as he just said it doesn't matter where they're seated if he goes into any team's building it's always going to be a difficult endeavor yeah. for said team a little bit the NFL has another controversy on its hands and once again it involves questions a draft prospect was asked at the combine running back Darius Geis out of LSU said he was asked if he liked men by one team and if his mom was a prostitute by another Madeline your thoughts I think this is ridiculous. I mean, the fact that it is a top prospect will likely be taken in the first, maybe the second round of the draft. This is not the first time and or not the only inappropriate questions he was asked. But like you mentioned, like people were asking him, I heard your mom sells herself. How do you feel about that? Now, he reacted and he responded to this saying that he thought it was clear that teams were doing this to see how he would respond. But this method is problematic. I mean, it's illegal to ask about sexual orientation in a job interview. First of all, fundamental discrimination laws prohibit questions like this. But second of all, he's not the first player to say something like this. I mean, remember, Eli Apple talked about how the Atlanta Falcons said it was the first question that they asked in the interview with him. And he also said it appeared to see, you know, how they how he would react to it. I understand as a team, you want to put these guys in uncomfortable situations and see how they handle themselves. But also considering the context of this and considering the legality of this, this is a job interview and it should be treated as such on both sides. None of it is applicable to football. Right. All right, you want to see how somebody handles some things, you know, put them in a, in, in a high stress questionnaire on football right. or, some, or throw them a press, curveball question. Press their personality in other ways, but calling his mother a prostitute? Yeah. No, of course you shouldn't do that. I mean, it's a it's a duh. It's almost disgraceful to even have to discuss it as far as, you know, um, his sexuality. If I was doing my best to play some sort of perverted devil's advocate, I suppose they could say, look, in our league, you know, that there might be a PR problem or there might be some issue in the locker room. But then why don't you just do what's right and not ask that sort of question and not invade somebody's, you know, life choices in, in that way? There's really no defense for it. What, what I was trying to prove there yeah. is by in attempting to construct a defense, yeah. you see that the defense just doesn't hold up. And I mean, when this happened with Atlanta, the team issued an apology for that question the NFL said they were going to look into the incident calling it disappointing and clearly inappropriate two years later still happening what is the NFL doing about this and I think that's one of the NFL's you know macro problems here is the the culture and adapting to the times as popular as the league is a lot of times we see I think socially especially they're behind the times and that's something they're either going to have to uh, adapt to or, or we could see more talk about, you know, declining interest or, or controversy at, at best. Right. Now, elsewhere in the league, the Seahawks have traded Michael Bennett to the Eagles, with Seattle effectively closing the window themselves on this group. Now, from Philadelphia, from Philadelphia's perspective, are the Eagles prime for a dynasty right now? I won't go that far. I mean, okay. it's very hard to have a dynasty. I in think the Max Fucci is ready for the dynasty. Oh, de definitely. He's, he, he's be ready. pumping his fist right yeah. now. But when you're talking about the, the Eagles and, and dynasties in the NFL, the Patriots are the exception. It's okay. the reason we say 
they're so much different than everyone else. I mean, the, the Seahawks, who just traded away Bennett, had a mini dynasty. If the Eagles, in, in a sense, as far as the NFL goes, the Eagles can get to that level, sustained excellence, putting yourself in the mix every year. That's really your goal. Their GM is excellent. I like the trajectory they're headed on. I like the move for them. And also, you know, to what we were just talking about, they now have a bunch of guys who are outspoken on social issues, and they don't seem to be concerned about that. So obviously there's not a, a um, correlation between that and a, and a lack of winning or anything like that. The Eagles aren't worried about that at all. I mean, adding Bennett to a group that already includes Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham, Derek Barnett, Chris Long, defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz's aggressive system. I don't see any reason why this coming off a Super Bowl winning season wouldn't be an elite group. I, I, I think the Eagles are something to watch. Well, sometimes people talk about addressing your weaknesses. There's nothing wrong with making your strengths stronger. Right. And the Eagles just made one of their greatest strengths, their ability to get after the passer even stronger. Well, and especially the in the NFC Bennett. East, challenging those offensive lines elsewhere in the division, that could be a thing. Well. Aside from elite quarterback play, I think the second most important thing in the NFL is getting pressure on the opposing team's quarterback. Speaking of quarterbacks, Peyton Manning sold his 31 Denver area Papa John's restaurants just days before the NFL and the pizza chain ended their sponsorship. So while Manning may be an insider trader, according to reports, he could also be looking at trying his hand at a new trade, as the reports indicate a bidding war between Fox and ESPN for his services could lead to him being offered up to $10 million a year. Is any broadcaster worth that? Ten million dollars I mean, a other year. Than me? That <laughs> is that is like some Jay Cutler come back and play football kind of money. I mean, I think it, it is clear that ESPN and Fox are kind of looking to counter that Tony Romo to CBS move. Tony Romo moving into the booth has been a, a great success for that uh, for that broadcast. He's had some great insight. Peyton Manning, of course, a media darling with all the ad campaigns between Papa John's and Nationwide and the jingles and such. He's very much primed for the media market. $10 million is a lot, but who am I to judge? Peyton, get that money if you can. I, you know, I don't think any broadcaster or any analyst is going to affect how much interest I have in watching a game. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm going to watch this game because Peyton's on the call as opposed to this game. However, if, you know, if I'm watching a game already and the broadcast team is doing a great job, it might keep me interested longer if the game is perhaps going bad. But there's no one who's going to say, oh, I have to watch this game on Sunday at 1 p.m. because Peyton's on the call. That's the issue. I'm not judging whatsoever. I mean, Peyton Manning is clearly camera ready. Yeah. He also clearly has the, the mind for the game if you ever watched him play. He I mean, would be... He yeah. was credited for being offensive coordinator on the field. But I don't know if ever in the history, maybe out of the, the curiosity of the first time, people are tuning into the game right. simply to hear the, the commentary. Right. And over under how many times he calls Omaha in the booth. I, I feel like that needs to be worked in there somewhere if he does get in on it. He's got enough of a sense of humor where I think you gotta he could. Get that, you got to get that trademark in there. Maybe right as they're going to break or something <laughs> like that. We're talking NFL and the talk of the NFL combine with Shaquem Griffin. So I wanted to remind you, you can catch the exclusive feature, the unstoppable. Shaquem Griffin on SITV, our new premium content network also featuring original shows and your favorite sports movies. Here's a clip for the whole thing. Start your free trial of SITV on Amazon channels or you can just Google it. I know I had doubters. People gonna say you can't do something but it's up to me to kind of prove them wrong. Handoff and a big time hit. That's Shaquem Griffin. What a night as he had. My dad would never allow me to make the excuse of why I can't catch the ball. The throw pass tipped in the air. It's an intercepted. It is by UCF at the 30. He just didn't look at it as a disability. I got a shot and he took full advantage of it. You tell him he can't do something, his. He going to do everything in his power to prove you wrong. We now welcome in the MMQB's Albert Breer, courtesy of Toyota Let's Go Places. Albert, the Seahawks dealt defensive end Michael Bennett to the Eagles Wednesday. Philadelphia was already over the cap and low on draft picks before the trade. How will this impact the decision to trade quarterback Nick Foles? I don't think it impacts it much. I mean, I know a lot of people look at it and say they're adding salary, but the truth is they're actually going to wind up saving money um, when all of this plays out. He is, in essence, going to replace Vinny Curry on the roster. Vinny Curry's on the books for $9 million. Michael Bennett's on the books for $5.5 million for 2018. So they'll get $3.5 million in savings there. 
They actually don't lose a draft pick. They just move their fifth round pick down to the seventh round. And so they don't lose any draft capital. They do save a little bit of money. It's a really smart move, if a short-term move, because Bennett's a lot older than Curry is. Now, on the Seattle side of this, the Seahawks are looking at a defensive rebuild. Does this Bennett trade signal Richard Sherman as the next piece to go, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty much a fait accompli now that Richard Sherman's going to be gone. And this offseason was always going to boil down to five guys on the defensive side of the ball for the Seahawks. Um, Sherman and, and, and Earl Thomas are both going into contract years. Then you got Cam Chancellor and Cliff Averill, who are both dealing with career-threatening neck injuries. And then, of course, you got Michael Bennett, who was a little bit of a pain in the ass for the team last year and wasn't playing to the level he had in years past. And so, really, the way that the team was going to approach the next few years was going to be dictated by how they handle those five players. They decided now is the time to rip the Band-Aid off, and this is just the first phase of it. Um, they're really retooling the team, and they're going to be retooling the team around Russell Wilson on offense and Bobby Wagner on defense. What will be interesting to see is for so long they've allocated so many of their resources on defense, and it's worked. They've had a great defense, five playoff appearances, three division titles, two trips to the Super Bowl, and a championship. It'll be interesting to see now if some of those resources shift to the offensive side of the ball. Maybe they get Russell Wilson a little more help, and maybe the team becomes a little bit more Russell-centric. Now, shifting to Los Angeles, the Rams traded Alec Ogletree to the Giants, a young guy who just signed a four-year extension. Earlier in the week, they sent Robert Quinn to the Dolphins. Why are the Rams shedding defensive players after a successful season? <laughs> I think a big part of it is long-range planning. Now, look, I, it's hard to defend the Ogletree move. I, I understand why they did it. Wade Phillips doesn't really value off-ball linebackers the same way he does edge rushers or corners. But they had seen Ogletree in, in, in Wade's defense when they signed him to this deal. So... That one becomes a little bit more difficult to defend. Robert Quinn's a little bit older. Really, the global um, look at these two trades is they need to clear some space um, because going forward, they're going to have some guys that are going to cost a lot of money. And it starts this offseason with Aaron Donald. They also could look at signing Todd Gurley to a, to a long-term deal now and budgeting out of, here, out of this year going forward. Eventually, they're going to have to pay Jared Goff. And if Marcus Peters w w works out, you know, and having traded for him from Kansas City, then he's going to be expensive as well. And so they've got some really nice young pieces to build around. Those guys are relatively cheap right now, but they won't be cheap for long. And so part of this is the long-range planning. Again, the Ogletree move is a little harder to swallow because they just signed him to that deal four months ago. But every one of these moves to shed some salary has to do with long-range planning, with the keeping the core intact as a priority. Now, all these deals could possibly open up the floodgates for teams moving forward. Yeah. Which big name do you see being the next to move? Well, there are a number of guys. And look, this has changed a little bit, Madeline. You've got some more aggressive young general managers out there. And so I think where we would have seen some cap casualties in the past, now we're going to see some trades. And so Richard Sherman, the Seahawks are certainly going to shop him around. My expectation is it's going to be hard to sell him because he's expensive. He's a little older and he's coming off of an Achilles injury. But certainly they'll see what they can get for him. A couple uh, other defensive backs, Aqib Tlaib and Tyron Matthew, will be on the block over the next few days. We'll see if the Broncos and Cardinals can move them. Both of them are also expensive. And then on the offensive side of the ball, Eric Ebron, the tight end from the Lions. Expect Detroit. We'll see what they can get for him. And then, of course, everybody knows the Dolphins are trying to move Jarvis Landry. It's another one of those situations where the money attached to his name, and he's got that $16 million tag on him, is going to make it difficult for the team to trade him. All right. Well, the new, new league year starts in just about a week. Lots going on. Thank you so much, Albert Breer, for the insight. Joined now by the author of Getting to Us, How Great Coaches Make Great Teams, and, of course, renowned college basketball analyst Seth Davis. And, Seth, the, the premise of your book really is that there is no one way for a great coach to bring a team together. To that point, which two coaches that you profiled were most dissimilar? Maybe just in terms of sideline comportment, maybe Jim Harbaugh on the one end and Brad Stevens on the other. And they're both great coaches, and you, you hit it on the head. I think a larger theme of the book is that there is no one way to do this. And one of the uh, threads that I weave through the book is something that I call the peak profile, where I highlight individual characteristics of great leaders. So it's persistence, empathy, authenticity, and knowledge, P-E-A-K. And so that's where authenticity comes in. There's no right way to do it, but there is a right way to do it for you. What I learned is that it is the steady application of the small actions and decisions 
and uh, learning processes that you go through over time. So you're doing it hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, and then one day you look up and you've been doing it for 20 years. I think that's one of the things that all of these men have in common is the, the persistence of it. It's just kind of doing your job every day the right way and trying to learn, trying to grow, trying to always adapt, and then over time, you become a great coach. I'd argue managing personalities might be the most important thing. And there's an anecdote in there about Doc Rivers and some ego clashes maybe at the NBA level. And, and he had this realization where he said, you know, just because you don't get along with someone doesn't mean that they're a bad guy or, or something to that effect, right? Did you find that there was a difference in how the guys who were coaching college level players versus the pros went about it? Well, yes and no. I mean, Brad Stevens is a great example of that because here's someone who started at the college level, did great, and moved on to the pro level and continues to do very well, and that's uh, unusual. Jim Harbaugh has also coached at, at both levels. And then, you know, one of the quotes from Brad Stevens is, all the great ones want to be coached. So when he got to the NBA, it wasn't like he was encountering a lot of players who felt like, you know, they know everything. And there's another thing that's a great point about, you know, a commonality is, you know, there's a lot going on in a locker room. There's a lot going on in the course of a game. There's a lot going on in the course of a season. And so for you to really whittle things down and decide and try to make it simplistic as possible, that's a, a sign of, of great leadership. Taking Stevens for a second, there's been a lot of high-profile college coaches who haven't exactly worked out at the NBA level. He really has. Maybe it was it his lack of stubbornness. What was it about Brad Stevens that, that allowed him to adapt? Well, the main thing is that he went to a great franchise. So he had other opportunities to pursue NBA openings. or you know, He didn't technically get offered any jobs, but certainly had some feelers put out because he was obviously a great coach. And uh, and, he, and he, by the way, he had offers to go to other colleges, you know, high, higher profile colleges than Butler, turn those down as well. Um, but so for, for Brad, uh, it was the intellectual challenge of moving on to the NBA, where you're taking a game from 40 minutes to 48 minutes, a shot clock from 35 seconds down to 24, that many more possessions, that many more decisions. Um, but I think his personality translates well to the pros because he's a very egoless guy. Now, that doesn't say, doesn't say he has no ego. Very confident, very competitive, knows he's good, but also knows what it takes to be good. And part of uh, being good is being humble, knowing what you don't know, respecting others' opinions, and relating to people uh, on an authentic level. So when you tell them something that maybe they don't want to hear, at least they know that you're coming from an authentic place. And Brad Stevens is nothing if not authentic. Now, you profiled a wide variety of coaches, but you're, you're known uh, for your work in, in college basketball. And, of course, Izzo and Mike Krzyzewski involved in the book, and, and Duke, Michigan State, a couple of the, the teams named with the FBI wiretap probe. What do you make uh, of the implications of that story? Well, it's ongoing. You know, it's very hard to, to come by, you know, good information. And so, um, you know, the, the Michigan State and, and Duke story is referring to a Yahoo report where you had an, an expense report that was filed by a guy who um, earlier had been uh, caught running up $42,000 of Uber charges on a client's credit card. So it's not a hard leap to think that he's falsifying an expense report to his boss. So we're only getting bits and pieces of, of, of information. I mean, it's, it's fascinating uh, that the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office here in uh, New York City um, is focusing on college basketball because they have investigative power and investigative tools that the NCAA does not have because the schools don't want the NCAA to have it and the schools are making these rules. So the NCAA can't subpoena witnesses. They can't wiretap. They can't you know, uh, subpoena for documents. Uh, the FBI can do all that. And we all know that there's been a lot of stuff going on under the table in college basketball and college football um, that is very unsavory. And I never thought of it as illegal, frankly, but I guess now when you're talking about, you know, wire transfers and uh, shady business arrangements that, you know, uh, corruption comes into play. But I would just caution everybody who is saying the sky is falling, the world is ending, the apocalypse is finally upon us. Let's all just take a breath. Let's take a step back. Let's get all of the information out. This case is going to take one to two years to play itself out. Let's see what really happened, what evidence they really have, and then let's go from there. I want to follow up on a couple things you just said. Interesting. Um, the NCAA seems to take the brunt of the blame for this, more so than the players and even more so than the, the schools. From what you were saying, do you think that too much is being put on the NCAA? So it's interesting. Whenever people say, well, the NCAA, the NCAA, I want to say, well, who are we talking about? Because this is a private association that is run by the membership. And in this case, the members are the schools. So the schools are the NCA. The schools make the rules. The way that um, uh, punishment and rules breaking and all that is supposed to be meted out is the schools are supposed to uncover the information, self-investigate, and self-report to the office in 
Indianapolis. So when people say, well, the NCAA, a lot of times they're saying Mark Emmert. So they're putting Mark Emmert on the, on the level of a Roger Goodell or an Adam Silver, and he's not. Mark Emmert can't even vote on legislation, much less make things happen the way a Roger Goodell can. So he uh, has a, a real fancy title with very little power. So um, that's part of the problem is that when you have, I mean, think about it. You've got 350 schools in Division I. You've got five power conferences. Someone's got to make rules and enforce them, and there, there's no one, no one person has their hand to the wheel. I actually think that college basketball needs a commissioner, someone who could say, hey, we've got problems here, or we're not modernized, or we need to improve these things and get our rule book from 4,500 rules down to 300, but there's no one in charge to do that. So nobody acts unless there's a huge crisis. Well, guess what? there's a crisis, and I think that people are ready to act. Yeah, a lot of this is treating the, the symptoms rather than the root Correct. cause, right? Correct. Would you be surprised if any of the coaches that you profiled were knowingly violating any rule? I'm a little too old to be surprised. I have a little more gray in my hair <laughs> than, than, than you do. So I, I try not to be surprised by anything, to be honest. I mean, it's um, I've covered college basketball recruiting for a long time. It is an inherently corrupt enterprise. I mean, uh, Jim Beheim has had two postseason bans. Um, now, we can get into the chapter and verse of exactly what happened there, and he, he wasn't named in any of the violations and blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, while he was a coach at Syracuse, there were two postseason bans. Um, a, a big part of the problem, which I think and I hope is going to be addressed, is the area of agents. Because you've had the combination of underclassmen rushing to go to the NBA, so the, the kids who are draft eligible are becoming younger and younger. And then over the last 20 years or so, you've seen an explosion in summertime basketball, which is outside of high school. So these are AAU grassroots programs who are being funded openly and legally by shoe companies or runners through agents. So you have this whole unregulated area, and a lot of people aren't sure like, what the rules are, what's legal, what's not legal. And if you want to do something that's truly illegal by NCAA standards, it's not that hard to move money around. So the only question is, at what point do they say, we can't afford it, it becomes like prohibition, right? Like, we have too many rules that we can't enforce. All of these things are happening. Let's make it legal. Let's bring it out into the open. Let's make it transparent. Let's regulate it and monitor it, and that way we'll have a more feasible model for the 21st century. So, like I say, change usually doesn't happen unless there's a crisis. Now that there is a crisis, I'm optimistic that we're going to see some real change. So on two of those rules, are you for players being able to sign with agents and be paid for it and be um, paid by shoe companies while they're, they're still in, in college? Two separate questions. The agent issue is the, the crux of the problem. So I have no problem with um, players, high school players, college players having some type of a professional affiliation with agents. I think there it should be room to discuss financial transactions, whether they be loans that are supposed to be repaid or um, you know, maybe a certain level of cash that's capped at a certain number. I don't think it's going to be a free-for-all. I don't think the schools want that. What I don't think you're going to see happen is the professionalization of college sports. People say, oh, these kids are making up. We're only talking about you know, a very small percentage of people who play college sports. And I'm talking about like the non-revenue sports. So the fact that you have all this money coming into men's basketball and football is allowing hundreds of thousands of soccer players and volleyball players and golfers and baseball players and swimmers to get some form of scholarship assistance. And they don't want that to go away. But like I say, I, I, I don't have all the answers, but I do think that there's more room to open this thing up. If someone wants to be able to get paid to get an autograph show, if you're selling somebody's jersey, they should get a cut of that. I mean, there's areas that they can go into and open up and modernize without just throwing their hands in the air and saying anybody who wants to make any money for anything can go ahead and do that. So to me, the compromise position is allowing those guys to, to go get money in, in some way, shape, or form because they're the ones who you can say they're not really in school necessarily. I mean, they may be, but they're not necessarily in school for the, the scholarship and those benefits because they're being signed to help you get to the Final Four, I think, as Le LeBron sort of said about it. Well, right? but the, the thing is, is now, of course, this is an NBA rule with the one and done, but yeah. after your freshman year, you have options to uh, go make money playing basketball. In fact, as a, even coming in as a freshman, you have options. You can't go to the NBA. You can go to the G League. You can go overseas. I mean, there's professional basketball being played all over the world. Why do these kids – to me, it's like I'm actually surprised that more kids don't do that. Why wouldn't you go to France or Spain or China – make six figures in dollars instead of playing American Lithuania. basketball. Lithuania, exactly. <laughs> you know why they don't do it? Because they want to be in college. They want to play college basketball. They want to try to get to a Final Four. And then you have, you know, these people who've played in the Final Four saying, you know, these, these uh, players should boycott the Final Four. You know, that, that would really make change. Can you imagine growing up your whole life dreaming of playing in the Final Four? Summer conditioning, fall workouts, 
all these games, all these practices, all these work, you have this great experience, you win the regional final, you're going to the final four, you're gonna sit out because they're not paying you enough money. What? No kid is gonna do that, including people like Jalen Rose and Jay Williams who are calling for it. They played in the final four, they didn't sit out. You know why? Because they wanted to play in the final four. So obviously there is some merit to playing college sports or more athletes would take advantage of the commercial opportunities overseas. No, uh, very good answers on, on all that stuff, and, and obviously you've thought a lot about yeah, it. Yeah, it's what <laughs> I do. Just to switch gears really quickly, because yeah. I think I'd be remiss to not ask okay. about it, given that you profiled Tom Izzo mm -hmm. in this book. How do you think he's handled the sexual assault allegations at Michigan State? Very poorly, very poorly. Now, let me, let me say, let me redefine the question. I think he's, he's handled very poorly the... Um, the public relations media aspect of it. As far as what he actually did in those cases, based on the reporting that I've seen, um, I think maybe you could say he could have done more, but really it shouldn't be the basketball coach's decision about whether a kid plays. Now we have Title IX has been amended and it's, there's a Title IX protocol and an investigation that takes place. I think it's moving out of the hands um, of the coaches, but you know the, the case involving the players and his uh, now former assistant—it wasn't really assistant; it was a grad assistant. Those guys never even got charged. So to say that you know somebody shouldn't play or shouldn't have a job who hasn't even been charged with a crime, what is the coach to do? So I think there are areas that he could defend. The problem that I have with what Tom Izzo has done is that he's not answering questions. And I understand he's in season and he feels like he's under siege from the media. But at the end of the day, I'm a big believer in transparency and just saying, hey. Here's what happened. Here's the information I had. Here are the decisions that I made. Uh, if you want to say that I was wrong, then have at it. But at least do it with accurate information. And I will say this. I think it is very unfair to take what happened with Tom Izzo and even what's happened with Mark D'Antonio and their football team and lump that into the same punch bowl as Larry Nasser. Larry Nasser is an evil monster. Mark D'Antonio and Tom Izzo are not evil monsters. They're men who are in powerful positions, who are called upon to make decisions that, that frankly, they're not qualified to make and not disinterested enough to make. So I wish Tom uh, had been more aggressive answering questions, and I hope, I'm sure he won't do it now with the tournament about to start. This team could make the Final Four. <laughs> they're that good. Uh, but I hope there will come a day in the near future where he just answers every question there is to answer about these cases and let the chips fall where they may. Seth Davis, author of the book, Getting to Us. Fascinating profiles of a number of high-profile coaches, Mike Krzyzewski, Tom Izzo, Doc Rivers, Brad Stevens, and more. Appreciate the time. Thank you. After almost making their way into the quarterfinals, Tottenham couldn't withhold Juventus and lost 4-3 on aggregate. After the game, Juventus defender Giorgio Chiellini stated, It's the history of Tottenham. They always create many chances and score so much, but in the end, they miss something we believe in the history. We now welcome in Planet Football's Luis Miguel Echegaray. Luis, is the mentality of Tottenham preventing them from winning the big games? First of all, happy International Women's Day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think calling it mentality, like blaming it on that, I think it can be a very generally, like a, a really not a great thing to do because, well, first of all, let's remember Tottenham, you know, tied against Real Madrid at Real Madrid. They beat Real Madrid in Wembley. You know, this is a team that really worked so hard on determination, passion, hard work. This is just was a key where like for 20 minutes, Juventus turned it on, and Allegri made some key substitutions, and in the end, they took over. Tottenham still is a team that has a high-press system, and when you do a high-press system, by the latter stages of a match, what happens is that things can break down. And Juventus, who is a very experienced, just like Chiellini said, you know, understands that the importance of the Champions League, the fact that Gianluigi Buffon, you know, the most famous goalkeeper, has never won it. They wanted it for him. I think focus for 90 minutes in that match and the one uh, in Italy really meant something for that. Now let's talk PSG after a transfer window that, bought, that brought PSG, both Neymar and Mbappe. For the second year in a row, the French Giants managed to crash out of Champions League in the round of 16. Are changes coming for this club? Well, see, this question I can bring in mentality <laughs> because this is the biggest problem for PSG. PSG has a team, a squad of 300 million euros plus. You know, Neymar costing more than 200 to come in. So many stars. The problem with PSG is that there is no heart, no passion, no real cohesive understanding within the squad. And Unai Amity, who's a very good coach, he's a level two coach. He came from Sevilla, which is a very good team, 
but they're not a PSG, they're not a Real Madrid, they're not a Barcelona. So when you have a manager that doesn't understand how to manage star power, this is what's going to happen. So the key thing for PSG is to bring in someone that can sit down in preseason with these players and say, you haven't won anything. You don't deserve this shirt yet because you don't understand what it means to be a hardworking soccer player, which is what Allegri does with Juventus, hence them beating Tottenham. Speaking of shirts, maybe they're at the, the crossroads, <laughs> perhaps. Oh, my God. I mean, that's very good. It's the dragon, dragon ball. <laughs> Meanwhile, Liverpool continues to remain hot after routing FC Porto on aggregate 5 to nothing. Do they have a chance at winning the Champions League? Yeah, sure. Everybody. I mean, I think at this point you can give anybody a chance. The problem with Liverpool, though, is that, again, they play in, you know, Jurgen Klopp, the coach, plays in such a high-press, fast-paced system that they sometimes forget what happens at the back in order to defend. This could be a problem when they face a real powerhouse like a Real Madrid or a Barcelona, you know, coming into later, if Barcelona, of course, beats Chelsea, which I'm sure we'll get to. To me, I think that Liverpool's biggest problem, not problem, but something that they really have to work on, is the starting eleven and understanding what it means to defend when they don't have the ball. It's all good to press, press, press and intoxicate the opposition, but when you don't have a set system after 70 minutes, when you're getting tired, then you're going to concede. So it's going to be really interesting to see who they face, you know, moving on to the tournament. All right, and you mentioned it. Chelsea plays Barcelona next week. Can the Blues upset Barca at home? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and this concludes our interview. And we can go. <laughs> no, listen, uh, anything can happen, right? I'm never going to say nothing's impossible. And obviously, I have made some guesses and changes and predictions that have not gone my way. So it's not like it's not something that could not happen. But Barca it, is Barca. Yes. And also, let's remember, Barcelona at camp now is almost impossible to beat. Um, one of the big... This is what I see happening. Chelsea will try and hold them. And it's just... A riddle that is easily solved by Barcelona because they know how to play against teams that can really hold and hold their strength against them. Here's the issue, though. Iniesta right now, we don't know if he's fit. Now, that might be the tiny little thing that Chelsea might cling on to, but then you still have Messi, Luis Suarez, Paulinho can come in. You know, this is such a good squad. To me, the best squad in the world right now, you know, with Manchester City, I, I, I think that I, I just don't see it happening. I see Barcelona taking this one at camp now. Yeah, so it's like kind of that one in a million kind of the thing. There is a chance, but not quite. Yeah, likely. but then watch, watch Chelsea beat them and then me lose a job. So. And then we will rerun this. <laughs> <laughs> at least you had faith. Luis, thank you so much for taking the time and for Thanks, the insight. You can keep up with the latest soccer news on Planet Football on SITV, our new premium content network. And that's it for us today. We'll be back tomorrow with another live episode of SI Now at 1030 Eastern. But before we go, it is International Women's Day. And in the first installment of a new series for Women's History Month, SI celebrates the story of Olympic bobsledder Vanetta Flowers, the first African-American to win gold at the Winter Olympics, who overcame personal struggles for a repeat. Vonetta Flowers made history in 2002 when she and fellow American Jill Backen won Olympic gold in the bobsled in Salt Lake City. This was the first time in history women were allowed to compete in the bobsled at the Olympics. Not only did Flowers become one of the first women ever to win a gold for bobsled, she became the first African American in history to win gold in any sport at the Winter Olympics. These groundbreaking moments are monumental, but what most inspires me is her next chapter. After those Olympics, Flowers delivered twins by C-section, three months premature. There were many complications. Her sons spent weeks in the hospital. Still, she made it back to the Olympics in 2006. Truly, women can do anything. Last year, I got to ride the bobsled on the same track where Flowers made history, and I got choked up thinking about what that win meant for all women and all people. So Vonetta Flowers, you're my inspiration.